Bitcoin is astronomy, crypto is astrology. I'm sorry, there is no uniquely valuable use case for any cryptos except for Bitcoin. They all fall for Social Security and Medicare, and they all fall for more defense spending and bigger government. One side might talk about cutting spending more than others, but they don't do it. Bitcoin might not care about politics, but politics cares about you because they want to tax you. As long as Americans have the right to protest and oppose and deny TBDC, as long as Americans fight for privacy and against surveillance tech and AI that's closed source and controlled by Google, OpenAI, Microsoft, that we have a chance to have peaceful transition and a natural transition and evolution from the US dollar to Bitcoin. Bitcoin will become the dominant long-term store value. If you send Bitcoin to a new address, nobody knows if you control that new address. So that's privacy for you. We really need a hard money that is cannot be stopped, cannot be taken away, and that's Bitcoin. Before we get in the current topics, I, I want to just get quickly why you are so passionate about Bitcoin. Yes. So it's partly because my late parents were both born in China and grew up in families that were on the losing side of the Chinese Civil War, meaning they were Kuomintang or KMT, not communist. And growing up, they hated communism and the culture revolution and all that many people by the way in case your listeners don't know tens of millions of people died during the cultural revolution in chinese civil war mao zedong was a horrible dictator and he basically confiscated on my dad's side of the family gold jade silver jewelry furniture house stocks bonds all these assets so we went from sort of upper middle class to poor because of confiscation. So that helped me understand the importance of Bitcoin as a bearer asset, something that cannot be taken away and cannot be stopped. If I want to give you Bitcoin, I just push a button and you just accept it. Once you have it, no one else has it. I cannot take it back. So that's once I was able to put two and two together, and it took me a while, <laughs> then I realized why Bitcoin was so important. So I had a little bit of an unfair advantage over others who do not have that story. People important to them had very strong views about confiscation or were victims of confiscation and asset seizure. Yeah, I think it's interesting because like, uh, for me, in Austria, most people don't get Bitcoin. They're like, oh, it's a luxury good. And those who get it, they're like, yeah, I just keep it on exchange because they don't they trust the exchanges. They're like, like uh, they, they will not do anything wrong with it. Uh, I mean, even after FTX, they saw after FTX, they saw Celsius, but they're like, no, my exchange is different. <laughs> no, I, I don't need to hold my own keys. Like I can keep it on there. So like sometimes I feel like in privileged countries, they are like a little bit blind to what actually can happen to you. And they're not looking all over the world what actually can happen in every country like USA or Austria or Europe. They're not excluded from, from that. It can come to them. It will come to them if, if the fiat system continues like that. Which also brings us to, to one of our current topics. I think it will become more and more a topic of the podcast. And <laughs> Unfortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you see it, um, the U.S. elections, like it started, I think, a lot off with RFK even last year at the Bitcoin conference talking about Bitcoin. Then this year uh, with RFK and Donald Trump and so many other politicians actually at the Bitcoin conference. How do you assess right now the, the current state of like Bitcoin, politics, ETFs, U.S. elections? What's your, your current take on it? Sure. So my current take is uh, Bitcoiners did a great job with RFK Jr. His policies and his understanding, his passion for Bitcoin is crystal clear. So that's fantastic. Obviously, no one's perfect, especially politicians. And he did do, I think, a podcast with Charles Hoskinson, the Cardano scammer, and called him a Bitcoiner, which is wrong. With Donald Trump Jr., I thought it was very good, but it's looking not so good now because Trump has not mentioned Bitcoin by name since the conference. He ended his speech at the Bitcoin conference with 
have fun playing with your Bitcoin, your cryptos, and whatever else you play or playing with, which is kind of very Trumpy, kind of a fuck you, frankly, or F you to Bitcoiners. Like, thanks for the money. It was less than I expected or whatever. And, you know, F off. And then yesterday he came out with a DeFi or his kid came out with a DeFi scam that I believe Trump promoted or we posted about on Truth Social, not on Twitter, but on Truth Social. And to his audience, and I get it, you know, he has huge debts to pay from his legal problems. Um, and he's supporting his child, which any good dad should do, but it's pretty scammy. And let's not forget that MAGA token promoted by Donald Trump Jr. again, was uh, something that there was an event for using the Bitcoin Nashville 2024 logos and having David Bailey, founder and, sorry, not the founder, but the CEO of Bitcoin Conference, maybe as the founder of Bitcoin Conference, he was the only listed special guest for that event. So they named, used his name and likeness. They used the Bitcoin conference logos to promote this so-called side event that he uh, felt like he needed to or wanted to attend and support. It's a shitcoin, obviously. So this is one of those why Bitcoiners are so upset about, I like Bitcoin, buy my shitcoin. So I would say, um, I, I just did a report card. It's, you're asking a great question. I said, presidential, Bitcoin presidential report card, according to me, RFK Jr., A+. Plus, uh, although I should probably lower it given the Cardano affiliation. <laughs> um, Donald Trump, B+, plus, which arguably stands for bad plus terrible, but take it as you will. And, you know, maybe falling because of the, I think Bitcoin is damaged when it's associated with scams. I really hate scams. I believe in consumer protection. If you're going to defraud somebody or mislead them, you can do that to big banks or institutions or wealthy people, you cannot do that to retail, especially U.S. retail. These are working people. They're often poor people. It's wrong. And it's, frankly, often illegal. Uh, so B plus for Donald Trump. And then lastly, quickly, the land of the plane, Kamala Harris, I would give her a D. She has pro-digital asset growth policy or stance, but there's zero specific Bitcoin policies yet. But that's why I started Bitcoin for Harris at Bitcoin, the number four Harris. Please follow. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a American. I'm born in the U.S. So I'm, and I did sales, so a little overly promotional, perhaps, for a more straightforward and humble Europeans like yourself. Um, and I support Kamala Harris for non-Bitcoin reasons. But also for Bitcoin reasons, I think it's important to donate money, raise money, get a seat at the table. Because if she becomes president, we will have a leg up to those of us who helped her to hopefully advance self-custody policy, push no CBDCs, push no debanking, and push right to mine and privacy and things like that. I actually think just to on with this, Kamala Harris in her speech yesterday at the Democratic National Convention, her acceptance speech as the official kind of Democratic nominee for president, she mentioned Trump doing scams. And he, he is. He's done four NFTs himself and he's promoting scams by his by his child and possibly other children. And Melania did an NFT, which to me are scams. These are all I like Bitcoin by my shitcoin scams. I think it is realistic, but very hard to overcome Mark Cuban and other billionaires, Brian Armstrong and others, who are trying to buy crypto policy with the Democrats and Republicans, but with the Harris administration by pushing for, let me scam in peace legislation. But giving Kamala's prosecutor background, the fact that she thinks Trump scams, I think given the huge amount of Americans, millions of Americans have lost billions of dollars through crypto scams, I think Bitcoin is a safe play. It's a safe asset to promote. 
And then, you know, we can see we're not going to like necessarily ban crypto. I think that's a mistake. But to not kind of promote, let me scam in peace policies and still prosecute the next SBF or mini SBF, right? And other scammers. I think that's important to protect Americans. And I think that will help get her votes and also get Elizabeth Warren off her back. That's really interesting. Um, I have three, four really interesting questions uh, for you about that. But the first sure. I want to start with. Bitcoiners often have this thing in their head, like I have Bitcoin. I have, I don't have to care about politics. Like, uh, I meet a lot of Bitcoiners. I was like, I can even talk for myself. Like I was in politics. I was, uh, head of a youth organization, um, in my local area. Like it's really small because like it's in Europe and Europe is small. Then there's like Austria. Austria is even way really small and it was just one small region and the youth organization, but I was the head of that youth organization. So I got a little bit of taste of politics uh, and I was really in there uh, and I liked it. I was like, I'm always a competitive guy. Uh, but then I found Bitcoin and I found more and more that I'm actually not that interested in politics. So with Bitcoin, I came away from Bitcoin, from politics. But the interesting thing that happened the last year or two, I was getting more realistic and I was like, I'm a person still on this planet and I have to care for my physical presence where I am because this politics actually affects me. <laughs> uh, maybe politics doesn't affect directly Bitcoin, but it affects me as a person holding <laughs> Bitcoin. So of course, if the US now goes into full, we ban Bitcoin things. I don't think Bitcoin might be slowed down, might be a short term, medium term, not as good, but long term, it will be still amazing. But maybe you as a US citizen uh, really um, uh, are negatively impacted by a bad ad administration of uh, Bitcoin policies. So I'm getting more and more back into politics where I'm like, oh, you have to care about politics. Um, long, a uh, long question for uh, you. How important is a politics for a Bitcoiner. For Bitcoiners, it's very important because Bitcoiners and Bitcoin might not care about politics, but politics and the state cares about you, the Bitcoiner, because they want to tax you. They don't like the fact that you have a bearer asset that they cannot confiscate or tax easily. That the fact that you can transact permissionlessly peer to peer. I could send you Bitcoin. I could send you a billion dollars of Bitcoin. And someday maybe I will do that. If I have enough Bitcoin, you need some Bitcoin. But I, I doubt I'll be that in, in that position. Hopefully you'll have Bitcoin. But I can send any family member or person I want to help in the world to just digitally um, Bitcoin almost instantaneously, make, maybe takes 10 minutes to settle. And no one can stop it. It's irreversible. I can do a billion dollars of Bitcoin. Imagine trying to do that with a plane load of gold or physical cash. That plane's not taking off from LAX. I live in Los Angeles. Even if it lands, let's say in Vienna, uh, not only is your bit, your gold or physical cash being confiscated, you're being, and being detained. You're being detained. You personally will be detained. They're being like, why are you seeing a billion dollars? Or, oh, sorry, of gold or physical cash. What's going on? So, yeah, the state has an interest in increasing their power. That's just natural. Um, it's an entity like any other entity that naturally wants to get bigger and stronger. We have to fight against that natural tendency. I'm more naturally for a small government. Ideally, no government, but I think realistically, small government and let people do what they want. So socially, I would say I'm progressive or liberal. Physically, I'm conservative and want smaller government. Interesting. Uh, do you think when we look out like maybe 50, 100 years from now uh, and Bitcoin is actually successful, uh, we have Bitcoin, whatever the 
or whatever it means that Bitcoin is successful. But let's say we have kind of a Bitcoin standard. You can pay mostly in Bitcoin. Everyone accepts like Bitcoin is the main store of value. Maybe even um, mostly uh, use it as a medium of exchange. Maybe even a unit of account. But uh, let's let's just take this debate on side. But um, when Bitcoin is successful, what, what is then the role of, of uh, do you think the role of government will be more service-based or do they still have the same type of control over the citizens because they don't have the money printer anymore or they have a very limited money printer because it uh, inflation and Bitcoin is so good? It's such a great question. I think, but I'm not 100% sure that um, government will be much more limited, will have far fewer wars because it's hard to print money to, to finance it, print as much money out of thin air and create it um, because you can't print more than 21 million Bitcoin. And that's all that will ever be mined, not even printing. Um, but I think it will be up to us Bitcoiners who are in early. Keep in mind that we are very early. Bitcoin at $1 trillion or so market cap is less than is about 0.1 percent of the total assets in the world which is about 900 trillion dollars worth so think about how early we are to already be in bitcoin and many of us already have one bitcoin or a significant portion of one bitcoin that's fantastic we're all going to be very wealthy or i should say our, our grandkids or great grandkids will be very wealthy in 50 to 100 years. So that's going to be great for them. And it's up to them to not abuse that power and take advantage of the poor. Because there will be people who have 10 sats and that's all they have or whatever I, it is. I love the analysis of, of I think Jesse Myers uh, put it out with like the 900 mm -hmm. trillion and the 0.1% uh, and then there's like yeah. the the the, the the unknown question, the, the question that is really interesting to think about how much of that whole 900 trillion, or maybe, maybe it's even, uh, more to, now because I think it's one year old now, this, this analysis. Um, how much of that total assets Bitcoin can realistically, uh, take? I think Jesse Myers, uh, conservatively takes 20%. Um, then some people say like, uh, oh, Bitcoin is money, so it's it's fifty percent of everything. So fifty percent. Do you have any framework to think about how much of the total assets uh, Bitcoin can observe, no, no matter a time frame, because time frame is really hard. Yes. So this is hundreds of years from now, but I think it can be much closer to a hundred percent than zero percent. So way over fifty percent. Here's why. What is the current allocation breakdown? the 900 trillion a lot of it is in real estate real estate needs to be demonetized it's ridiculous it's just a place you live in uh unless governments remove property tax right you have this tax on this asset that's funding a lot of the schools and so forth and government's way too big the public pensions the public union workers are way overpaid in America. You can make half a million dollars a year for doing custody, <laughs> being retired because you work three different public pension, public jobs for local or state government. It's ridiculous. That's number one. Number two, government is way too big and bureaucratic and wasteful. They spend a lot of money on projects that don't accomplish what they're set out to do, at least in the United States. I don't know as much about Austria, although I imagine it's similar because, you know, Europe is, I would say, further along towards um, socialism and bigger government it's worse. than the United States. Yeah. I'd love to hear stories sometime. But, um, uh, and then I'd also say that, um, so, so real estate is about, I don't know, 400 trillion, 300 trillion needs to be demonetized. Bonds, a lot of bonds are long-term or medium term, and those need to be demonetized. So all these long-term stores of value are going to be replaced if we're wildly successful. I would say Bitcoin's already successful. 15 years in, we're down over a trillion dollars. It's being adopted by two out of three 
major presidential campaigns, although RFK Jr. has zero chance of winning, he can play kingmaker, queenmaker, and kind of help decide if Trump or Harris is going to be the next president by supporting one or the other and telling his voters to follow. So um, two out of three U.S. presidential candidates are Bitcoin, pro-Bitcoin. Kamala's on her way. I have confidence she'll get there, but I'm not at all sure she'll get there. So that's why I'm working so hard to, regardless of whether you're voting for her, I think it's important that people donate to her campaign through my link or another link that is clearly for Bitcoin, pro-Bitcoin policy, not pro-crypto, because they just want to scam in peace. And Mark Cuban threw Bitcoiners under the bus by calling us elite Bitcoin maxis who just care about our own Bitcoin banks. So we really need to have government and politicians be pro-Bitcoin. Is maybe RFK one of the, the deciders of the election? Uh, I, I feel like uh, he, he will probably decide where he joins. And I think he's Democrat. Is he's he? tried to run as a Democrat. And the, Demo the, the way power works, I think you know this. I think a lot of Bitcoiners know this. But for maybe, and you're, you have a very sophisticated, older audience from around the world, and a lot of them are Americans. So I just say to the few that are just joining because they're interested in why is a Bitcoiner supporting Hamas, I would say that whether it's a Democratic Party or Republican Party, the powers that be, the powers in picking who the rest of us vote for. Does that make sense? If you have the power to decide what is acceptable, among the political candidates that the rest of us can hear from through mainstream media on political debates of war for, you've already dictated what the range of outcome is to something that you can live with to something that you really want. Right? The, the choices are all okay to you at worst. So we're picking from not very good choices because we don't have the power to pick who the candidates are. We're picking from a very narrow selection of people does that make sense and policies yeah it's interesting because just for example in austria we will have five different parties uh in the in the parliament of austria uh and they are the the biggest party will probably have like 25 percent of the votes so that's like a really big difference to uh, america where the, the there's just two parties and there's like i, I understand there's like third and fourth parties but they're so small that they, so small they're almost and they're not there ineffective yeah they're very ineffective unfortunately so yeah so we basically have a unit party in my opinion and i think a lot of your audience will agree with me both republican and democratic presidents administrations senators congressmen they all vote for Social Security, Medicare, and they all vote for more defense spending and bigger government. They talk, one side might talk about cutting spending more than others. That would be the Republicans, but they don't do it. The deficits grow under both parties. The spending grows under both parties. I don't know what delusional, I guess the rhetoric is important, but they must think the voters are very stupid. And then the Democrats talk about, you know, being anti-war. <laughs> it war as much as the Republicans, at least Trump, even though I don't like him. And I think it's totally unpresidential because he won't concede when he loses based on the rules. But the rules are the rules of the game. You can take the game, hate the players. But once you've run out of ways to appeal, you cannot sit by passively as some folks peacefully visit the Capitol but some folks were not so peaceful. Maybe it was 90% peaceful. Maybe they were incited by feds and um, goaded to become violent. But that was, you know, some of the stuff looks scary, even if it's 99% peaceful, just like the George Floyd riots were mostly peaceful, but then you saw burnings. 
building down and people getting attacked and police officers getting injured by protesters. So I see both sides. I think um, Trump will not concede peacefully necessarily, just like arguably he did not on January 6th. So, but both parties are for growing government. They don't cut government. They're fiscally totally irresponsible running massive deficits, our debt to GDP ratios, ridiculous. And even our federal net outlays, Robin, meaning revenues from tax and fees uh, are very low compared to the amount of GDP. So we need to improve those ratios. We're never going to pay the U.S. debt down. I don't know if you know Morgan Housel. He's very smart. I wish he was a Bitcoiner, but he's a very smart economist, wrote a great book. Anyway, he said, look, just like after World War II, the U.S. will probably grow our way out of the debt so that the tax is collected on a growing GDP. If the GDP grows faster than the debt, then you can collect more taxes, and that's how you deal with increased debt, right? You're never going to pay the debt down, but if the economy is growing big, faster than the debt at some point, then you're probably okay. But that's the problem is debt is growing so fast and the growth is not there. So it's very scary. And we're in a time of relative peace. Very few Americans are brave servicemen members. Very few Americans are deployed in combat right now. So we're not at war, even though we're involved in wars. The American military is mostly not at war, so that's good. But imagine if we are at war, and war is very expensive, what that's going to do to the economy. So we're one sort of economic or natural disaster, health disaster away from not be going full Weimar and becoming the next Austria. What, what do you think uh, would happen if, if we have something like maybe like a second COVID or something like that, where we uh, really spend aggressively again? Uh, <laughs> I mean, the inflation is already a lot, but then on top of that, because I think a lot of the inflation we still will experience later, it is not like directly coming. No. Um, what, what will happen then? Is, is that an sure. hyperbit conversation so, in five years? Yeah. So, um, Before I answer the question, I want to challenge the premise just a little bit, if I may. So as an American, and I don't want to come off like a crazy gun-toting AR-15 assault rifle American, but I am for the Second Amendment. I think it's extremely important. And we cannot have a situation where we have another COVID lockdown. That would be a disaster for the economy and civil rights. And just mentally and emotionally, The isolation, especially for people who are extroverts, it's ridiculous. It's not just that people don't have the right to work and make their own decisions, and they're giving us an experimental vaccine that seems far more dangerous, especially to young men, than we thought with these um, myocarditis risks and other risks. So this kind of unproven vaccine that I'm like, and I'm not a vaccine conspiracist, I'm not anti vax The other vaccines work because they've been through the FDA normal process. This process was expedited and they gave Big Pharma immunity, total immunity. So they're not liable for anything. <laughs> It's ridiculous. Um, so I think at this point, they can sunset and re repeal the immunity. And if they are going to give people suggestions or recommendations to get a boost or whatever, That's fine. People can do what they want. Um, hopefully, the censorship of people who warned us, doctors and medical professionals who warned us that this vaccine was dangerous and experimental and that COVID uh, risk was pretty low to moderate or almost zero for healthy people, especially young people. Obviously, it's different if you're older. We know that. We know that it's different if you're immunocompromised or extremely obese or have heart condition, whatever, comorbidities. But people should be able to make their choice. I think the right approach would be to recommend 
strongly that people stay home if they are high risk or caring for someone who's high risk, which is risk averse. That's fine. If you're an introvert, you almost prefer to stay home anyway and not have to deal with people. So maybe you have the right to work from home. I think that's great that people, you know, don't have to go up, go to work necessarily, but that should be up to the employer and maybe, yeah, no. So, so, so I want to, I do want to challenge that premise a little bit, but to answer your question, if there is a second, let's say just disaster where they have to spend a lot of money. I think the U.S. can handle it, but I think there's going to be a huge collateral damage to weaker countries that are denominated that use the U.S. dollar as their legal tender, whether it's Ecuador or other countries that use, uh, I'm not sure if Ecuador still does it, but they did when, when I visited countries that use, use the U.S. dollar as legal tender. I think they'll be greatly affected from the massive money printing. Um, they're just weaker countries economically than the U.S. I really believe in the U.S. dollar milkshake theory by Santiago Capital, I think that the U.S. will coexist with Bitcoin. He's not a Bitcoiner, but I think the U.S. dollar will coexist with Bitcoin for a long time, with the U.S. as being the global reserve currency and short-term store of value. Bitcoin will become the dominant long-term store of value and increasingly slow, so as it demonetizes art, real estate, long-term bonds, and so forth. So, yeah. Will the other That's what feel I Will the other fiat currencies uh, go away and the US dollar will be used? I mean, yes. stable coins kind of do, yeah, yeah. do, do more of the work for, for US dollars. Yeah, so, so that, that's a great example. In Latin America, right. my understanding is when you visit Argentina or Venezuela and other hyperinflation countries, they prefer physical cash, US dollars. They prefer, for long-term store value, gold and Bitcoin. And then for medium exchange, it's really physical U.S. dollars and things like Tether, maybe USDC, because that's just what they're, they think has real value. So being the global reserve currency is a winner-take-all phenomenon. The euro, the Japanese yen, and the Chinese yuan are distant second, third, and fourth currencies, and the British pound. Those sort of currencies are not very important compared to the U.S. dollar. Everybody wants to do the U use the U.S. dollar. The U.S. Navy and U.S. military and U.S. government and U.S. intelligence because we control and have so much power keeping the shipping lanes open. There's a strong incentive for countries in the Middle East to sell their oil and, and other countries to sell their oil denominated in U.S. dollars. So petrodollar will continue for some time. U.S. dollar will continue to be the global reserve currency, I think increasingly so, so as um, the hundreds of currencies or many dozens of currencies start to implode and people just start to move more and more to a U.S. dollar reserve currency. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign 
individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin. Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for those amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. I also feel it, uh, that will be definitely medium term. But do you think long term then uh, the play comes like Bitcoin versus US dollar at some point? Or is it like, oh, US dollars always will, will be coexisting? I am extremely optimistic that as long as Americans have the right to bear arms, as long as Americans protest and oppose and deny TBDCs, as long as Americans fight for privacy and against surveillance tech, an AI that's closed source and controlled by Google, OpenAI, Microsoft, or right, or, or whoever else, that we have a chance to have a peaceful transition and a natural transition and evolution from the US dollar to Bitcoin. Otherwise, I think we're fucked. And we're just gonna be our our, our grandkids or great 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 grandkids will have there's gonna be war and a lot of people die. So I, that's why I think it's so important that we have a lot of Americans who own Bitcoin, a lot of Americans who own guns and can defend themselves and have privacy and security. It's very important. I, I don't um, need to, you don't, like, you as an American don't necessarily need to own a gun, but it's very important that your neighbors do so that nobody knows which neighbor owns guns and which doesn't. If no neighbors own guns, then you're gonna have a situation like communist China, Stalin Russia, and Nazi Germany, where they can kill millions of Jews, millions of Russians, millions of Chinese, because they can't defend themselves. You just have knives and you know forks, it's ridiculous. How are you gonna defend yourself? when the other side has machine guns and weapons, bombs and stuff. Yeah, that's an interesting point because I think a lot of Europeans don't get this. Um, I more and more get this. Yeah, as more I don't know what you guys are taught in school, but that's not good. I think Americans, because the American Revolution and just so many Americans hunt and own guns legally and you know, popular in the US for, for men and women to go to the gun range post pictures on Instagram of themselves at the gun range. <laughs> it's a very different. And I'm not a gun nut at all. I choose to live in Los Angeles where I have friends and family. I love the weather. I love the food. I love the people. And, you know, socially I'm liberal so, or progressive, so it works for me. Absolutely. Uh, it's interesting for me because even like uh, when there is a government that knows the citizens have a lot of guns, they think more carefully what they do. Like I, as a president of a, uh, of, of a nation um, where I know all my citizens have a lot of guns, I, I would be more careful with the actions I do because I know civil war is a real thing. Like they, they can come together and they can do something against governments. Uh, and also what you said, like um, that, that the neighborhoods you, you don't know which neighbor has a gun and which one doesn't. And that's a, that's really a good protection. I mean, there's also like Absolutely. Bitcoin, you need it for monetary things and then a gun for, for physical things. Absolutely. Because we live in the physical world. And that's something that crypto people, the scammers don't understand. And some naive speculators and investors don't understand. There's a digital world where Bitcoin can give you freedom and rights. And then there's a physical world where that's separate. So for example, you can't put real estate 
on the blockchain or gold on the blockchain. It doesn't make any sense. Or IBM blockchain um, ran ran ads. IBM ran ads for IBM blockchain during the U.S. Super Bowl. What we call football, what you guys call, or whatever you call it. <laughs> um, and they're trying to put tomatoes on the blockchain. It doesn't make any sense because anybody in person could pretend that these are organic tomatoes, no GMOs or whatever, but actually they are inorganic and have GMOs and just lie. Cause you know, you, just because you tag something saying not GMO free and organic doesn't mean it is when someone could just swap it out for something that's, you know, has pesticides. Do you think we, uh, because you mentioned scams a lot, do you think we get rid of all the scams uh, at, at no, some point? I think that's not realistic. All we want to do, and I'm a big proponent of scams, again, big proponent of reducing or lessening scams on Bitcoin or off Bitcoin. But I really care about less scams on Bitcoin. Meaning, for example, right now, if you go to ordinals.com, you can look up all sorts of offensive things. So they'll have kill the N-word, kill president, kill presidential candidate, or I love a fascist or communist dictator. Just all sorts of offensive speech and hate speech. And you can do these things. And I post about it on Twitter at TY and Clubhouse. Sorry to promote again. Uh, TY and Clubhouse. I posted about this, but you know, for your audience, because there are a lot of Europeans and we Americans are too crass and too uh, brash and terrestrial. So I'm trying to be polite, but you can look this up. It's ridiculous the amount of stuff that is permanently on the Bitcoin blockchain. You have cat pigs, you have dick, derriere, cartoons, I'll just say all sorts of ridiculous things that where they're trying to scam U.S. and other retail and do a rug pull and pump and dump. The reason it's bad for Bitcoin is to increase the load on the blockchain and increases the attack surface by having hate speech, child porn, or state secrets and nuclear bombs and nuclear codes or how to build a bomb, how to build machine guns or whatever, how to print a 3D machine gun. All these things you put on the Bitcoin blockchain just gives the state U.S. government and other authoritarian governments an excuse to sh not shut down Bitcoin, but to ban it. And bans can be a little bit effective for those who are law-abiding, ban self-custody, ban other things. And some people will be like, you know what? It's not worth it. And companies and entities, churches, nonprofits, unions will be reluctant to self-custody Bitcoin because it's illegal, right? Because, and you just don't want to give the state reasons to attack Bitcoin. So these scams are attacks on Bitcoin when they're on Bitcoin. And they're also attacks when they're off Bitcoin, but I don't want to talk about that right now. This, the scams on Bitcoin are attack also because they ruin Bitcoin's brand because they make Bitcoin look like Ethereum and Solana, but like incompetent versions. Because you can't make money as a scammer or early speculator, even if you're not a scammer, just early speculating on these scams because there's no demand for it. That's why, except when they're trying to, you know, temporarily for a couple minutes or a couple weeks or a couple months, log the Bitcoin block space with spam and scam, they can increase the fees, but only for couple months. Look at what happened at the halving. The halving transaction fees were through the roof. People were threatening and taunting us that you, this would be your last chance to consolidate your UTXOs, that there was permanently going to be high demand for scams and spam on Bitcoin, and there's nothing you can do about it, all this art and NFTs on Bitcoin. And it died down, and fees were under 40 cents for a long time per transaction. So. You just cannot have, you want to reduce scams on Bitcoin because it ruins Bitcoin's brand and makes Bitcoin indistinguishable from Ethereum, except for Bitcoin is hard, credibly finite, and just like a bad version of Ethereum. Poor man's shitcoin launcher. 
And Solana right now is the main coin launcher of choice. And Bitcoin has main coins on top of it, but they're unsuccessful again. So even if you're a scammer, because is it worth it to be derided in Bitcoin Twitter by people like myself and special forces unit of many, or, or not many, but several dozen at least Bitcoiners for hardcore and want less spam? You're never going to stop it, but it's not about stopping. You're never going to stop murder. That doesn't mean you don't want to try to reduce the amount of murder. So it's pretty ridiculous. These spam enablers and scam enablers to say, well, you haven't stopped the scams, so you lost. I would say scammers lost and the spam and the scam enablers lost because not only did they not make money doing this, but their reputations are forever tarnished. As supporting scam because a lot of my fellow anti-scam people take screenshots and use Rayback machines. So is it worth it for you as a Bitcoiner to try to make an extra dollar or an extra Bitcoin or an extra few Satoshis to scam on Bitcoin so you can scam retail the working poor so that you can buy more Bitcoin for yourself? It's disgusting. They should stop. But, you know, we know some of them won't. So we just have to make it not worth their while and point out that people keep losing money scamming on Bitcoin. You can go to ordinals.com, you can go to Magic Eden, CoinMarketCap, TradingView, look up all these scams. And the only scams that are transitorily succeeding are the insiders and <clears throat> expert scammers on top of Solana and Ethereum. The Bitcoin scammers are incompetent and unethical, which is like a, not a double negative, but it makes me respect them even less. If you're going to scam people, you need to do it like CZ, get away with $30 billion, pay a small, well, for him, a small fine of tens of millions of dollars or whatever it was, not go to jail, go to jail for two months and retire with 30 freaking billion dollars or whatever. Prime pays if you're good at it, unfortunately. Prime doesn't pay if you're bad at it. And you ruin your reputation, you look ridiculous. You just look like a clown. Because you're incompetent and a dick for scamming people. I'm sorry. I used to work on the Wall Street trading floor. I went as long as I could without cussing. I'm sorry, Robin. Feel free to I censor know. this. <laughs> no, no worries. It's your, it's your show. You can filter. I'm for filters. I, 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 I usually don't filter. I, okay. I I never filtered actually. I only do it when. No, I actually never did it. I off, always I this off could be the first guess. time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was worse on 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 the podcast already. <laughs> wow. Oh, okay. Okay. But uh, the question I was asking uh, is like, what what can we as the the random sure. gap, the random Bitcoiner do yeah, against? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Against scams or. Yeah, Bitcoin. against yeah, okay, uh, so scams against that. I think um, if you're on Bitcoin, you don't even have to tweet. Just like my tweets, like the tweets of other Bitcoiners who call out scams, give a like emoji or heart emoji when we're calling out scams on spaces, whether it's crypto spaces or Bitcoin spaces. And, you know, don't let your friends and family or your neighbor, coworker, fellow churchgoer, whatever, don't let them lose money to scams because it makes Bitcoin look ridiculous. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a quick story. I have a Harvard Law classmate. I went to Harvard Law School, so name dropping because, you know, I'm American. <laughs> also my ego. And then I have um, an immediate family member just a few months ago, not very long ago, maybe a few to several months ago. I talked about Bitcoin and they said, isn't that a scam or that scammy, right? Even after Fidelity and BlackRock announced they hadn't launched yet, I believe, their Bitcoin ETFs. Two of the most reputable, biggest, most credible institutional players, financial institutions in the world, that these people who are normies, no pointers, whatever, would respect. According to them, BlackRock and Fidelity are credible, right? Not, not according to Bitcoiners. System. So it's just the, the lack of education, the lack of awareness is just stunning. 
And the more, the longer we let scams continue, whether it's on Bitcoin or off Bitcoin, the worse it is. Because it becomes ingrained in people's head that, hey, not only did my sister lose money in scams on Bitcoin or crypto scams, but also my aunt, my uncle, my grandpa, my neighbor, my, uh, my neighbor's, you know, best friends, my best friend, my classmate, everybody's losing money on these crypto scams on or off Bitcoin. So the more you have people get rug pulled, the more Bitcoin is going to be compared to crypto. And Bitcoin is astronomy, crypto is astrology. I'm sorry. There is no uniquely valuable use case for any cryptos except for Bitcoin. Tether transitorily, temporarily has a use case as kind of a bridge between fiat and the Bitcoin world so that people living in countries of horrible currencies, like Zimbabwe and others, they can transact in something that's a short-term store of value, not long-term store. Yeah, uh, very true. I, I, I'm always ashamed that I had a shitcoin face. Uh, but I'm very happy that I'm over that <laughs> since a long time now. <laughs> it's like everyone has uh, some. Uh, I feel like everyone has Almost gambling then. Yeah. Stefan Lavera, my former colleague, sorry, left sorry. Um, he did not shitcoin, but he got it right away. But I shitcoin. I shitcoin even in 2021. I apologize for it. I did big clout and NFTs, which is like a double negative, like. Two, two horrible things, one, one worse than the other, and, uh, partly to support, or in large part to support an artist that I was close to uh, who could not you know, tour or make money during the pandemic because of lockdown. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we all, almost all. <laughs> we, almost all it. shit. Like, yeah. <laughs> when, uh, people, when people outside of Stefan Lavera, and a few others. If someone says they never ship coins, I don't believe them. I think they're lying or delusional or have selective memory. That's true. That, that's very true. Either you like before your shitcoin phase, like you you will enter it soon, or you lied, or there are some some exceptions, of course. Yeah. Uh, really interesting. W one last topic that because we are sure. already closing to the to the one hour mark. You mentioned it a little bit with with privacy. Um, do you feel yes. there's a, a war on privacy, on individual freedom Absolutely. rights, and all, all those things? Yes. It is the in the interests of the CIA, NSA, U.S. government generally, and intelligence agencies around the world, and governments around the world, as well as central banks, I think. I need to think about that more. And definitely many big corporations, whether it's Google, or Meta, or OpenAI, or Microsoft, it's in their interest to break privacy because they want to know what we're doing so they can make more money, right? Even Apple. So Apple might be a little better about protecting your privacy from third parties, unless maybe they get paid a lot of money. But, you know, they want your information so they know what's going on. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe opt out, but I think some of their defaults could be greatly improved. So yeah, there's a war on privacy. Um, Dieter Bob, of all people, and I've had my battles with him. He's a total jerk sometimes and a little bit crazy. But he just tweeted out something that made me think and realize that I didn't quite understand privacy in Bitcoin as well as I thought I did. Because, you know, developers talk about, you know, we want on-chain privacy, we want more engineering capacity, and I respect that. Not sure where I come down on it. Pretty close to the pro ossification camp. I'm really in the very slow and steady camp. We need a lot of code review. We can't afford a third inflation bug in a nine year span, right? We've already had two. So, like, I'd like to go nine years without another inflation bug, however difficult it is to execute. And our last one was discovered in, I believe, 2018. Anyway, so. Privacy, what Dieter Bob said is, <clears throat> if you send Bitcoin to a new address, nobody knows except you, if you control that new address. 
So that's privacy for you. Because you could say, oh, I sent it to someone. And I don't know why it hasn't moved, but, you know, they have it. I don't have it. Right? It, I don't control that address. Are you going to prove that you, Robin, control a new address? How is someone going to prove that? The state or you know, someone trying to invade your privacy. So you can help create privacy that way. And then from that, even from that new address, you can just send it to a new address. And then that new address sends it to yet another new address. So you have this daisy chain of new addresses. Nobody knows. I mean, maybe you control all 10 addresses by the time you send it, right? 10 times down the chain, but um, maybe you still control it, but maybe you don't. Maybe you have no relationship at all. You know, after the first transaction to all the down chain transactions because it just keeps you and you move to a new address. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense because um like let's play the game like I don't know in Austria the government is going crazy and they're exposing I don't know like fifty percent tax on, on Bitcoin. Uh and and then I'm like, okay, how do I get out of this mess? They have maybe an exit tax and all the things they they are not in place, of course, right now, but let's say they have it the the last resort in in bitcoin is like you can say that they have been stolen you have been hacked and then all your bitcoin go to one address uh and nobody can really say if you can control that address or not like you could actually be hacked by by someone uh and then the someone afterwards spends his uh, those Bitcoin in, I don't know, El Salvador, um, but this doesn't has to be you. And that's a really interesting point. Like it shifts the total control of the Bitcoin. Like I, lo I love the extreme example. Yeah, I, I love the extreme examples, even of like, if someone comes to your house, uh, they can shoot you, take your house, they can shoot you, they take your gold, they can shoot you to take everything. But with Bitcoin, you have the choice if you give it to them, or not, they can still shoot you, <laughs> but, but, but you can, uh, you decide if you give them the Bitcoin or not. And I think that's something so simple in Bitcoin when, once you get Bitcoin, but that's a thing that a lot of normies don't get. And th this is amazing. When I tell this someone that doesn't get Bitcoin at all, they're like, what that, that's actually, I can save my Bitcoin in my head. They, they are amazed by that fact. We Bitcoin know that, that we can just save Bitcoin in the head, but Mormons don't know that. No. And also the, no, we, I, we, we can do a better job. I think we can always improve and talk to more normies, meet them where they're at and explain things in simple ways. Like you just need to memorize 12 words and you'll own Bitcoin and control it. And no one can take it from you. And what? maybe you have a backup um, stored somewhere at your mom's home in the basement somewhere or something, a backup copy, just like you have a backup copy of your, you know, house key. And, and, you, and, you and brought two one... or three multi-sig or multi-sig is very interesting. Yeah, I think uh, w once you get to a certain amount of Bitcoin, um, you should definitely get, check out multi-sig and, and see what, what you can do. Yes. But, the, the, but the thing I wanted to bring up is like you mentioned before, um planes uh, and trying to get gold with planes from 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 Los Angeles to Austria that is so easy with bitcoin like you can yes. log if you, Ten if you minutes. it's so easy see yeah if you try to do this with like gold or anything else like they assume that you're a criminal as you said before they they will confiscate it, they will uh, take you with bitcoin you can just remember your uh, your uh, uh, seed phrase and you go go over the borders then put there in a, a safe multi-signature so that's that's really cool uh but yeah closer coming to the end as we already at the one hour mark um i have one question to end that sure. all my guests are getting um what can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about sure so number one please follow me at ty on clubhouse on twitter to learn my latest thinking i'm constantly learning and developing my thoughts into kind of something that's more organized for podcasts and i hope someday more essays but um twitter is my test net so go to ty and clubhouse to learn what i'm thinking but 
in terms of what else you can learn, go to the swan.com website where I'm now strategic advisor. So I'm kind of more on the outside, but helping with uh, things like fundraising, media, and some other things that'll be maybe revealed in the future. Um, that's a lot of fun and natural for me. I don't even consider work, <laughs> to be honest. Um, don't tell Corey. <laughs> but uh, uh, basically, um, at swan.com, you should be able to find some of the essays that I've written that really Tomei Strolai, um, who is our editor-in-chief of um, Swan Private Newsletter and other things, he's such a phenomenal writer. He really rewrote my um, my essay because the ideas were sort of there. They weren't clear, and he made them much better. So I've talked about Bitcoin and Wall Street, Wall Street Bitcoin. And um, I do think that if you are open to it, people can DM me to ask me more about my thoughts on reducing scams on Bitcoin and why Bitcoin is my hard money that is going to make number go up. So if you want, if you, all you do is care about price and making money in a risk adjusted manner, or even not risk adjusted, just making more wealth by Bitcoin and come help us protect Bitcoin from scams on and off Bitcoin, especially crypto scams and scams on Bitcoin. Um, so those are kind of where you can find, find me. There, there are some YouTube interviews. Um, some of them are out of date where I talk to Bloomberg, talk to Yahoo Finance, NASDAQ, and have done podcasts thanks to, in large part, to Swan and, and Corey Clipston, who had the foresight to understand that Bitcoin PR is very important. So we actually spend money on PR and the work of Moro's PR, PR firm, getting me those gigs. So very important. But but some of those are a bit outdated, but you can see the evolution of my thinking or feel free to call me out and challenge me um, publicly or preferably if you're nice on uh, privately DM uh, at 2 on Clubhouse. And um, yeah, I, I do check um, DMs from non people I don't follow from time to time. So it might take me a little bit of a while, but fortunately I'm at the point where now where most of the scammers trying to get me to buy crypto scams. Um, when they DM me on Twitter, they're filtered out. So I'm able to see the nine uh, followers. I'll follow you back and then we can communicate more easily. Amazing. Yeah, perfect. Thank you uh, already. We have one last question, uh, the end yeah, routine sure. question, uh, where the previous guest is asking a question for you uh, without oh, yeah, knowing sure. who the next is. That's the end routine. Uh, that question is... Sorry, who, who asked? Uh, the, the previous guest always. So okay. like the, always the previous guest is asking oh, yeah. without oh, knowing who, oh, who... Oh, I see. Got it. Yeah. Oh, I love that one. Okay. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And your question from the previous guest is, what do you usually recommend when a normie asks you what allocation to Bitcoin is optimal? Sure. Number one, the key is to never sell because Bitcoin will continue to do what it's always done, which is outperform every other major yeah. asset almost all years. Yes, yeah, some years it'll be ranked number 10 out of 10, but most years it'll be number one out of 10. So number one, don't sell. Number two, um, Lynn Alden and Hafa Zaguri, who was CIO at Swan Mining and former Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, a uh, very successful guy. They both talk about how you don't really need a lot of Bitcoin as a percentage if you never sell it. You can sell other things, real estate, your bonds, your cash, your stocks, your NVIDIA uh, ETF, whatever. Um, so. I think you start with a low amount, but not too low that you don't take it seriously, but enough that it hurts. You'll be mad at me or whoever, or maybe Robin <laughs> for a day because you watched this podcast and bought, you know, some Bitcoin, thousand dollars worth, a hundred dollars worth, whatever it is that hurts, but it's not too much that you lose sleep. That's not worth it, but you want to buy enough to start with that you will read books and listen to podcasts, listen to maybe all 200 some of your podcasts when you're stuck in LA traffic or if you are at 2x speed or one half x speed. So you get educated. 
about Bitcoin because you now have skin in the game. And hopefully, if we do a good job, you at least ask questions or to start increasing your Bitcoin allocation. Maybe you'll go down the rabbit hole like Michael Saylor after listening to Breedlove and reading Breedlove stuff and listening to Saifedean and reading the Bitcoin standard. You'll just go down a deep rabbit hole for months, come out of it and just be like, being 100% of my net worth in the Bitcoin or whatever you did. So I think it's as much as you can without selling it, meaning you have to understand it and you have to understand yourself because 2% could be a lot for somebody who's very risk averse. Losing sleep every night, it's just not worth it. Maybe it should be at 0.2%, <laughs> but I'm exaggerating. But um, not everybody should be at 100% even if they can afford to do it because um, it's too nervous. It, it makes you too nervous and you're going to sell at the lows. The other type of person that should not be over allocated Bitcoin is people with negative cash flow or who are one layoff or firing away from having uh, tremendous financial stress. One medical emergency away from having tremendous financial stress. It's just not worth it. Maybe 70% allocation of Bitcoin is good enough. Look, in the long run, maybe not us, but your kids and your grandkids, and I guarantee you your great, great, great grandkids are going to be fantastically wealthy. And your problem will be how do you leave a legacy of civic responsibility and caring about your fellow man or woman or human being, whatever gender, I don't care. Um, you want someone who is gonna be a good person and help other human beings. I'm here for people. I don't care about entities. I don't care about unions. I don't care about corporations. I don't care about Wall Street. I definitely don't care about government. I want people to win. Bitcoin is our ticket to freedom for all. If we play our cards right, it's gonna to be tough because CBDCs are coming. Digital surveillance is coming. Closed AI is coming. So we have all these things that are security and privacy invasions, all these things that are anti-people and anti-freedom. We really need a hard money that is cannot be stopped, cannot be taken away. And that's big one. That was beautiful. I love it. I think we can clip thank it you. and send it to all our normie friends. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Terence, for being on. It was a uh, pleasure talking with you. Uh, also, My thank pleasure. you for... Also, thank you for everyone watching and listening. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.